Hi, ActiveHistory.ca is happy to present a recording of Jessica Van Horsen's talk, Quebec's Asbestos Industry and McGill University, The Historic Relationship. You can check out recordings of other talks on the podcast page of ActiveHistory.ca. I'm here to talk today about the historic relationship between McGill University and the asbestos industry. Um, there was recently a CBC documentary that aired concerning this topic, and obviously as a historian, it's like, you forgot the history! History matters! Um, and so this is sort of my response. Um, also, um, this is the CBC website had this huge expose on it as well. Um, and so it was quite the big deal. Even the raging grannies were upset. And you know, when the grannies go, there's trouble. Um, so yes, having studied the town of Asbestos, Quebec, um, as well as the global asbestos trade for several years, I'm quite familiar with the McGill asbestos ties um, that have historically been around, um, as, well, as well as the legacy of these ties, because it's didn't just happen in the past, it, it continues to happen today. Um, following the CBC documentary, everyone at McGill received an email from the Dean of Medicine um, and the Vice Principal of Health Affairs here at McGill announcing that there was going to be an internal investigation into the accusations against uh, Dr. John Corbett McDonald specifically, who was targeted in the CBC documentary um, for his ties to the industry. Um, the email also stressed that McDonald was a pioneer in the field of asbestos-related uh, disease, and that even the WHO was still kind of, the jury was still out as to whether or not Canadian asbestos was really that bad. Um, and so we'll, we'll get into that issue, uh, because it's like really slightly toxic, is still toxic, but um, but anyway, what I hope to do with this talk is provide some crucial historical context for the issue, um, which I think it's pretty important, history. Uh, and, you know, the CBC documentary wasn't the most flattering towards McGill, I have to say. The representative from the medical department the CBC interviewed suggested that only scientists can really know about this issue, um, and I would contend that that's, that's not the case. Um, but... Yes, all the same. My goal is not to slam McGill. McGill has obviously, the research speaks for itself, um, but I would like to perhaps bring some context to it um, and help a broader audience understand the legacy of this, this relationship. Um, and it's quite the legacy of misinformation and miscommunication. And so that, I think, is very important to current issues dealing with Quebec and asbestos and, and all of that as well. Um, so, <laughs> I don't know if, if you would guess this, but every time asbestos is in the news, I receive about 50 emails. <laughs> guess what I saw? Guess what I read? Um, and it's drawing my attention to it, which is really cool. Um, when the CBC aired its documentary, I again got 50 emails around um, expressing shock and anger about this, this supposed tie. And... My response was, haven't you read my fascinating dissertation? <laughs> oh my, um, apparently not. <laughs> but also, I, I, I also was surprised at their surprise because I thought that society was a lot more cynical. It should not be a surprise that there are these ties to industry with every organization. But, but it's good that there still is cynicism and no, lack of cynicism in this world. Um, it, it did it shock me a bit about McGill specifically because McGill does have that pulp and paper affiliation still. Um, the University of Toronto has the Monk School of Global Affairs, which is funded by the largest gold mining company in the world. That This is how universities operate um, in Canada and perhaps beyond. And so this is sort of, um, just because asbestos is currently uncool doesn't mean it always was. And that helps to bring the beginning of the context um, to this topic. Uh, well, I would suggest that McGill's ties to the asbestos industry are similar to University of Toronto's ties to the gold mining industry. I would go a bit further than that and suggest that it is perhaps more similar to what happened at the University of Tuskegee between 1932 and 1972. 
Um, this was the Tuskegee um, oh, there's Monk School, the Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment. Um, it was run by the Public Health Service in the United States and the University of Tuskegee, and it was designed to study the progression of syphilis in the local African American population. Um, so these men were, they had syphilis or they were infected with syphilis, and then they were monitored under the guise of being provided state-of-the-art health care. They're going to be monitored, they're going to be taken care of. Um, none of them were given treatment of any kind. These medical professionals just kind of wanted to know what syphilis did to people. So, and of course, it was easier to, in, to watch African-American people than it was white people um, at this time in the United States. So, um, <laughs> following the Second World War, this, was, this type of medical experimentation was illegal, obviously, um, but just because it's illegal doesn't mean it's not done. And so it was freely done in the United States for quite some time. And that brings us back to asbestos, of course. And um, one of my first issues with the CBC documentary was that perhaps it gave too much focus to McGill um, and not enough to the people that this association affected. And, you know, I would say the town of Asbestos, Quebec, was the asbestos industry's giant laboratory. It was a living laboratory, and the people that worked there were the, were the mice in the labs, and they were treated as such. Um, yes, so that is um, the historical setup here. Let's see if this works. This is the town of asbestos here. That's the Jeffrey Mine, the world's largest asbestos mine. Um, it is two kilometers wide, deeper than two Eiffel Towers are high. That's the mill where the asbestos was processed. Those are the homes. This is how close the town is to the mine. This is their daily life. Um, and so obviously the mine isn't being worked at this time. It is still worked on occasion, but that I, I thought would just give you a, a foundation for when I talk about the town of asbestos. Keep that in your head that this is this physical reality of living in this place is quite um, quite stellar. Um, the largest percentile asbestos mine in the world, uh, this community had very little contact with the major centers of Quebec or Canada or the world, aside from through the resource trade. Um, it once supplied over 80% of the world's asbestos, which is pretty massive. Um, there are six types of asbestos in the world. The one found in Canada is chrysotile asbestos, and it's a different type of asbestos depending on which rocks it forms around. Uh, it formed about 700 million years ago here along the Appalachian Mountain Range. And, you know, I have some chrysotile asbestos to show. I'm going to talk a lot about dust during this presentation, and so this is perfectly, you know, it's a jam jar. I'm sure it's safe. If you don't want to touch it, you don't have to. But look underneath, this is the dust that I talk about. And when I say, you know, the accepted level of dust in an asbestos factory is five fibers per cubic centimeter, but in asbestos, it was actually 100 fibers. Picture this in the place you work, breathing it in. This is what's affecting your body. So I'll pass that around there. I also have in my handy Ziploc bag um, a sampling of what asbestos, chrysotile asbestos, can be turned into. Um, this is sort of uh, a decorative rock that would be found around a fireplace because, of course, you would like something fireproof to protect you from the start of fire. And so it is the white um, detail in that as well. And, you know, a Ziploc bag can keep spaghetti sauce in, and I'm sure it could keep asbestos in. Um, but anyway, so that is Canadian asbestos. It's Canada's main competitors throughout the 20th century were Russia um, and South Africa. Russian asbestos is also chrysotile, but because of the Western world's general fear, hatred, I don't know, avoidance of Russia um, throughout much of the 20th century, it wasn't much of a huge competition because, you know, even though it was still white, it was tainted communist red. Um, South African asbestos, on the other hand, while it, it, there are outcrops of chrysotile, it's mo mostly crocodilite, 
which is a blue asbestos. And the fibers are actually much longer than those found in Canada. Um, and therefore, at, some, at one point, they were much more valuable because asbestos was graded on length of fiber because it was used to make fabric. You would leave it to make fabric. And so, um, luckily for Canada, the world doesn't really like South Africa. It didn't, you know, it didn't help, it didn't hurt that South African asbestos wasn't white. Um, but also this general avoidance of, first of all, the dark continent, and second of all, the continent, or the, the country that had apartheid, we wanted to avoid South Africa altogether. It made us uncomfortable. Canada doesn't make people uncomfortable. Canada puts people at ease. We like it. Because um, Canada is too darn friendly to export something that will kill you, um, apparently. <laughs> This is the ABC defense, is that's what it's called, anything but chrysotile or anything but Canadian, um, asbestos is bad. And so this is really what drove the Canadian industry through much of the 20th century. It was excellent marketing. Um, the public as well loved this idea, and they still do today. Canada still is too friendly to hurt people. Um, so <laughs> this sort of shift from away from South African asbestos, even though it's technically a superior asbestos, um, towards Canadian asbestos was really caused by a lot of propaganda, pro-Canadian propaganda. Um, the three main diseases asbestos causes, does anyone know? Asbestosis. Asbestosis, that's the, the first one that was discovered, and asbestosis is a hardening of the lining of the lungs, the fluid lining of the lungs that, you, that builds up after years and years of inhaling asbestos dust. When your lungs get hardened, you suffocate to death, slowly and painfully, but surely you suffocate to death. So that's asbestosis. Um, it also causes... Mesothelioma, which is, well, it used to be a rare and fast-acting, um, incurable cancer. It's becoming much more common now, and uh, it affects the linings of major organs. That's basically where mesothelioma attacks. And lung cancer is the, set, the third main disease that asbestos causes. Um, although, the, of course, there are others, and we'll get into that today. We know lung cancer quite a bit, but... Um, there's been some some propaganda in that in that as well. Um, nothing the nothing's on the screen. I know it will be there in a second. <laughs> um, so yes, these are not the only diseases asbestos causes, but they're the ones the Canadian Medical Association freely acknowledges, um, partly due to the legacy of the Quebec asbestos industry, and possibly due to the complete lack of interest in the health of the working class um, populations of Canada. So I will ask you to try and forget everything you know about asbestos. It, let's go back in time. It is no longer this evil thing that we, we know it is. Um, let's go back earlier 20th century. This is a magical mineral. You want asbestos. It is amazing. Let me tell you. <laughs> if you had children, you would want asbestos in your home. This little boy can play with matches. Yippee. Um, <laughs> Everything in your home could be made of asbestos. Oven mitts, aprons, tablecloths, sheets for your children's bed, paint for your walls, shingles for your roof. Everything could be made of asbestos. And if it was, you had the safest house on the block. This was important. And especially in the First World War, Second World War, interwar period, people began to realize the importance of having fireproof homes. Um, there are entire communities in Europe made out of asbestos um, as a post-war reconstruction. So let's, let's think about it this way. Asbestos is magic. We all want it. Let's get more of it, more of it, more of it. <laughs> this is the attitude of much of the 20th century towards asbestos. Um, and the history of asbestos is about more than greedy companies hiding medical evidence for profit upon profit, although that is certainly part of it. The public wanted asbestos too. The public wanted asbestos to be safe, and if there was any way that a type of asbestos, perhaps Canadian asbestos, could be safe, they wanted to believe that. And so the public had a hand in this as well. Um, furthermore, people expect miners to get sick. Miners are dirty. They get sick. We know this. It's something they know. It's something they accept. Miners get sick. As long as little Timmy is safe from fire, it's okay that Jean is coughing up toxic dust. 
this is an attitude of much of the 20th century as well. So this is where we, we get McGill entering um, the, the scene. Uh, the first death due to asbestos-related disease was Nellie Kershaw in 1924. She worked in a factory just outside of Manchester, England. Uh, the company she worked for, Turner, Turner & Newell, owned an asbestos mine in Tufford Mines, um, but also owned a mine in South Africa. And so this gave companies like Johns Manville, who owned the Jeffrey Mine and Asbestos, the excuse to say it was South African asbestos that killed her, not Canadian. <laughs> Starting in immediately, the first death, blame South Africa. It's not Canadian, it's South African. And it goes on from there. Um, so she died in 1924. She was not given any compensation. She's buried in a, in a grave with five other people, I believe, um, in the same cemetery as the, the Sir Samuel Turner, um, who was part of the company's dynasty, which is very nice. He's got quite the monument. Um, that was in 1924. In response, in 1926, Johns Manville, which owned the Jeffrey Mine, uh, contacted its insurance company, Sun Life, um, and asked it to talk to McGill University into setting up a, a department that would investigate these sorts of things. Um, where would they set up such a department? How about McGill University? Even back then, McGill had some clout. Um, and so through funding of the asbestos industry, um, McGill established its Department of Industrial Hygiene, which I believe is now the Occupational Health Sciences Program here. No, perhaps not. Um, but the Department of Occupational Health Science, or the program, is the one in which McDonald was a professor in, a professor emeritus now. Um, and so there is... That is the root of the asbestos industry in McGill, 1926. Um, the director of the insurance company suggested to McGill's medical school that for the money it received to found the department, Johns Manville could provide guidance um, to the researchers in it. And in 1929, when the company received its first claim for compensation at one of its American manufacturing plants, it upped the ante, getting in touch with McGill again um, through its new insurance provider, Metropolitan Life, um, to see about launching a study on the asbestos workers of Quebec. Uh, Dr. Frank G. Pedley was the only medical professional in Canada researching asbestos-related disease from the 20s to the 40s, and he was asked to align himself with McGill's Department of Industrial Medicine in order to do this study. Agreeing, Pedley understood what was required of him, writing that such a plan involves a definite quid pro quo, which is something that the CBC documentary quoted, um, but what they didn't quite illustrate uh, in the documentary was that this quid pro, pro quo actually meant that in return for Pedley's acceptance of the way Johns Mandel would edit his report, he would get access to the people of asbestos. This was important. These were, this was ground zero when it came to asbestos exposure in Canada. And they were not allowed the workers in asbestos were quite segregated. They were protected by the company from outside medical um, attention. And so this was quite a big deal for a researcher interested in asbestos to get this sort of invitation. You would agree to some sort of cooperation with the corporation. Um, in early 20th century Quebec, health care was um, provided by the Catholic Church by and large, but in asbestos, Johns Manville had its own health center. It had its own doctors that were American. They didn't really speak French. Um, and they had state-of-the-art technology. These workers, just like the, the um, African-Americans in Tuskegee, were very much taken care of as far as monitoring. The, the company knew what was going on with their bodies, even if the workers did not. Um, and so that is the situation in which Pedley came into uh, the town of Asbestos. The company doctor that was there, R.H. Stevenson, who later became mayor of a neighboring town, uh, welcomed Pedley to asbestos, showed him some of the x-rays he had pre-screened um, to make sure they didn't have any evidence of disease. Uh, and Pedley wasn't really into x-rays all that much anyway. Um, and if we can believe Pedley's published report, which I suggest that we don't, um, he writes that no cases of specific disease have been reported among asbestos workers in the province of Quebec. And so 
that was Pedley's conclusion. Uh, he did not think to say that just because the workers hadn't filed claims didn't mean that they weren't sick. Uh, and just because Pedley was the Canadian expert on asbestos-related disease doesn't mean that he knew what he was doing. Um, asbestosis was the only known asbestos-related disease before the 1940s, uh, publicly known, and it manifests in a way very similar to tuberculosis. And so there was a lot of confusion here about, oh, maybe they just have tuberculosis. You know, maybe it's probably not asbestos-related. They coughed up blood, they had difficulty breathing, they lost their appetite. Um, and it was, it was quite a fatal disease. <laughs> Tuberculosis was the number one concern of Canadian doctors in the 1930s. That's what the medical journals are full of at the time. And it added to some of this misunderstanding, but it was also the fault of Pedley's supposed expertise. Um, as I said, Pedley was not a fan of x-rays. They were very difficult to read in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and he really favored a physical examination. And for that, we have a volunteer here. Hello. <laughs> I'm going to examine you. That's, that's scary. In the way that Pedley would examine a seat, an asbestos worker in 1930s Quebec. So your goal is to stand up and sit down as fast as you can, 25 times oh, in under one minute. <laughs> Please do. All right. Ready? if you did, that would take you a bit longer. You might start vomiting at the end of it um, or coughing up blood. That didn't happen when Pedley was doing this test. And so that was his reason for saying, you know, even if some of the x-rays show that there's asbestosis in these people's lungs, they're not complaining of it. They can do the chair test. Um, you know, I don't think these x-rays are right. The chair test is more accurate than the x-rays. So that, thank you, volunteer. <laughs> um, so this contributed to his conclusions about asbestos in Canada. This is a sign of asbestosis. These were the kind of images that Pedley discounted. If you could see, this is a big white cloud covering your lungs. It's sort of, asbestos is very much um, like wool that you can read. And so breathing fibers in, 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 eventually clogs your lungs with not, you know, the linings of the lungs. And so that is what Pedley didn't go for, but he went for the chair test instead. Um, so, yes. So, Johns Manville published his report after thoroughly editing it. Pedley was not happy with how edited the report actually was, even though it didn't show anything especially um, dangerous to the industry. Um, but Johns Manville said that, you know, the less said about asbestos and health, the better off we are. And so they just basically combed everything out that Pedley was perhaps concerned about, and there we go. His published report talks a lot about hernias and dent dental health, um, not about what's happening to these people's lives. So this began the legacy of deceit and deliberate misinformation stemming from the asbestos industry and McGill. Um, and just because JM produced one Canadian study on the workers in the town of Asbestos doesn't mean that everyone believed it. And in fact, most people outside of Canada saw doctors like Pedley as country bumpkins, even though they were affiliated with McGill. Um, the British company that Nellie Kershaw worked for, Turner & Newell, they, they have an interesting exchange around this time about Canadian doctors. They're not even cutting people open. How you know that you know they they openly write to each other? We it's Canadian asbestos that's killing our employees. 
how do these people even expect to know what's going on if they're not going to cut people open? And it's not like the town of Asbestos has a lack of bodies in which to investigate. So it was the lack of um, wanting to know what was going on, as well as a lack of skill or sophistication within the Canadian medical community that really contributed to these sorts of things. Um, so <laughs> that's, that's sort of, and, and Turner and Newell really objected to the slamming of the South African asbestos industry because it was, if it was cheap to operate in Canada, it was especially cheap to operate in South Africa. And so they didn't want this industry to suffer too much. Um, yes. So what McGill didn't know about making deals with the asbestos industry was that while it received money and guidance from JM, the company was simply using its name. McGill is a great name and it looks good on a letterhead um, and it has clout, but it wasn't interested in what researchers at McGill had to say. It knew what researchers at McGill had to say because it kind of told researchers at McGill what they were going to say. At the same time as they had McGill doctors looking into um, the disease occurrences in asbestos or the lack of disease in asbestos, it had um, a secret lab outside of Plattsburgh, New York, where it studied secretly autopsied lungs from deceased Jeffrey Mine workers. Um, they, the company lawyer brought them across the border um, to study in this laboratory alongside of the test device that they were exposing to dust to see the progression of disease. Um, so they did this throughout the 40s and 50s, and about 78 lungs were taken down from asbestos to Saranac Lake, um, which used to be a tuberculosis uh, respite center. Um, the people at McGill operating in this industry knew nothing about these studies, um, and they were instead content to do their own thing and then to jump whenever JM snapped its fingers. Um, this was an exciting industry to be a part of at this time. Second World War was starting. Oh my gosh, asbestos is amazing. We need to be part of this. If it causes anything bad, we are at the center of all of this. So they, they really felt like they were in a good spot. They didn't realize that they were being taken advantage of, perhaps, or also what making um, deals with companies like Johns Manville would, would mean. Um, so this was certainly a conflict of interest, violation of ethics, but McGill wasn't the only university in Quebec that um, was interested in asbestos. Uh, McGill had the perfect laboratory in the town of asbestos that it was occasionally given access to, um, but the rival asbestos producing company, Tetford Mines, did not have such company control as the town of asbestos. Um, in asbestos, the, uh, the deposit uh, is laid out in a circular pattern. It's, it's a global strangeness. that ha It's the only place in the world that this happens. This means that it, that's why it's the largest mine in the world, because you only need one mine to access all of the deposit. It's like a tornado cloud frozen in the ground um, in a circular pattern. Everywhere else in the world, it's a linear pattern. Tepper Mines is a linear pattern, and so you need multiple companies and multiple mines to get at the asbestos. Multiple, multiple companies in Tepford meant there was a lack of control over the workers. And throughout the 1940s, dying asbestos workers from Tepford were showing up at Laval. Finally, you know, they, they wouldn't go, when they were starting to feel sick, they would go to Laval to die. Um, and that really shocked the doctors at Laval University um, because they didn't see the length of the progression of the disease, which can take about 30 years to fully develop. Um, all they saw was the incredibly painful death that it caused. Um, so for these doctors to see these physical effects was quite shocking. Dr. Louis Rousseau was one of the main doctors investigating these, these men that came to him, and he published a lot of articles about the effects of the mineral in the human body and the effects of the industry on French Canadians. Um, he sounds like a very cool guy, um, Rousseau. Uh, he immediately began attacking asbestos companies operating in Quebec and accused them of hiding medical evidence from independent researchers. Um, although we also know now that Jan was hiding medical evidence from non-independent researchers at McGill. Um, 
his team were the first to discover asbestos-related cancer in Quebec miners. Um, mesothelioma was the first um, discovery of mesothelioma in Quebec. And he expressed frustration with the iron curtain around the town of asbestos, um, by, you know, put up by J.M. and McGill, suggesting that without these limitations, their heavily edited reports would be exposed to be lies. Um, Rousseau was correct. Uh, J.M. knew it. Um, and because of Rousseau's efforts, J.M. sped up the release of company-funded research um, papers that showed, um, originally that showed the mineral caused cancer after just 60 days of exposure in mice. Um, but the published reports, they just, they didn't have computers, but it was a control, find, delete, any reference to cancer. And so let's just pretend this didn't happen. Company correspondence um, makes it clear that um, this needed to be done uh, before French Canadian researchers elect to write something themselves. And so this was an automatic warfare going on between company funded medical reports and the French Canadian researchers. Um, there was something else John's Mammal could do to put a stop to the research coming from Laval. Um, you know, the good news for John's Mammal was that the reports were in French. This limited their distribution, um, especially during the Second World War when. France and Belgium were, were quite concerned with other things. Um, and the bad news, however, was that the reports were in French. <laughs> and the workers at the Jeffrey Mine were Francophone. And if their union discovered these reports, they would be distributed to them and problems would happen. So what they did instead, um, they didn't ask um, McGill for help in this case, although... Um, Dr. Viscan of McGill's um, Department of Industrial Medicine was present when Johns Mandel opened up its brand new hospital in asbestos in 1948, and he made a speech about all the excellent things Johns Mandel was doing for the workers of Quebec. Um, instead of asking him for help, the company asked the doctor they had placed at this hospital, Kenneth Smith, um, to, do, to do some sneaking around. And Kenneth Smith is a fascinating character, uh, he was trusted in the community, very much loved, actually. Uh, he sympathized with the workers during the 1949 strike. He wrote letters to JM officials urging them to protect the workers more. Um, but he also falsified medical reports, uh, put in place a system of job transfer to less dusty areas when an employee showed signs of asbestos-related disease. And uh, when asked, he befriended the main doctor in Tepsi Mines, Dr. Paul Cartier, and uh, convinced him to keep the workers in Tetford separate from Labatt. He encouraged them, when you're sick, come to me, don't go to the hospital. Especially don't go to the hospital in Quebec City. And this um, uniformity of procedure uh, was maintained between the two communities for quite some time, and it effectively prevented outside medical professionals from accessing these asbestos workers. And so the doctors at Laval had trouble getting bodies to investigate. And that effectively stopped their research. Technically, um, it, it's really interesting what happened here because the doctors at Laval didn't necessarily have to stop their research, especially with the 1949 strike that began at the start of that year, um, which publicized the effects of asbestos on human health throughout the newspapers of Quebec and, and beyond. Um, but it wasn't until 1967 that French Canadians started publishing on asbestos again. Uh, and even then, it was, it was far more advanced than the English Canadian medical community, but also much more sporadic as the French Canadian community was getting a bit more focused on its place in the world. Um, so, despite the control of, Anglophone, of the Anglophone medical community as far as McGill goes, um, and again, these ones, the, the researchers at McGill were seemingly the only researchers in Canada interested in asbestos at the time, um, and the apparent lack of commitment in the Francophone one. Uh, John's Mandel was warned by the international industry uh, that if the company didn't do something about the asbestos problem, cases of, of occupational disease would breed like rabbits and may grow as big as hares. And so John's Mandel was very... Uh, central to the global asbestos trade, and because of its role in the town of asbestos, it was seen as the expert on this sort of thing. It had to do something, or the asbestos industry would be ruined. Um, so, 
the industry was still not concerned that asbestos could affect the general public, and to some extent, it was still okay with working class uh, miners getting sick, because again, that's what miners do. Um, but <laughs> the problem with this was that the incidences of asbestos-related disease in the town of asbestos were getting so plentiful that you could no longer transfer sick workers to less dusty areas. Those less dusty areas were full. Um, so you had to sort of sacrifice these workers to the industry. Uh, furthermore, large clouds of dust, of asbestos dust, were hovering over the community. Uh, it's really picked up during the Second World War when production picked up. The mines worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, you could rarely see the sun. It was that dusty. It covered windows of cars. It covered laundry that was being hung out to dry. That this was very much a community issue, and the company's lawyer believed it was only a matter of time before the general public's exposure to asbestos became more widely known. Um, so, well, despite this, JM ignored a new Quebec regulation that uh, required the immediate reporting of any industrial disease and continued its campaign against South African asbestos to take negative attention away from the friendly Canadian trade. Um, as the company officials were beginning to fear that another storm was brewing in Quebec, this time concerning a case of asbestos with cancer. And so that was about 1944, that Johns Manville was very worried that cancer would um, explode in Quebec. And they called their, their friend, Maurice Duplessis, uh, to try to help them. Maurice Duplessis was the Premier of Quebec um, uh, during the 1950s, and he was easily swayed by the medical reports emerging from John Scandal and McGill that stated that asbestos-related disease was non-existent in the province. He um, helped make asbestos-related disease, he took it off of the compensatable industrial disease list in the province. It's never been put back on, um, and this is partly the reason why asbestos-related disease is such an issue in Quebec still today. These workers still do not get compensation. Um, and, you know, it's not just money that comes with this sort of thing. It's acknowledgement that they're sick. You know, if it's non-existent in Quebec. It's not a problem. So you're sick for your own reasons. It's not the industry's fault. And that has a profound mental effect on these people who are actually suffering. Um, but, of course... We're not going to change that in Quebec anytime soon, apparently. Uh, so that is, this is something, this marks a very big trans transition for the people of asbestos. They knew their own bodies. They didn't need a doctor to tell them that coughing up blood or not being able to walk upstairs meant that there was something wrong. However, being told that they were the last bastion of keeping the industry alive and therefore the town alive something started to happen, and they used their own bodies to say, hey, we're not sick at all, we're okay. That means the industry's okay. Um, and this is something that really starts to happen when Duplessis takes asbestos off of the list of potential uh, materials that could harm you in the workplace. Um, despite uh, these efforts, these government efforts, and company efforts. Reports of asbestos-related cancers started to really pick up in the 1950s. Um, and <laughs> perhaps realizing the lack of clout uh, or global reach of Canadian medical professionals at the time, even those at McGill, John Manville sponsored American doctors to visit the, the Jeffrey Mine to assess the workers' health. Um, again, these doctors were shocked at the underreporting of disease in the community, but just like with Pedley's report in the 1930s, um, they were heavily edited by Johns Manville, and all, their whole report concludes with, well, these workers are sick because they smoke. And this is a front page of Johns Manville News Pictorial, which was a company magazine sent to every employee and um, board member of the company. And this is a nice underground miner in the town of Asbestos, Quebec, smoking on the job. Miners smoke. This is what happens, and that's why they're sick. It was very convenient um, for the asbestos industry that the tobacco industry was collapsing at this time. They're like, hmm, not just us, them. And, you know, there was no acknowledgement that in cigarettes you had asbestos filters. Um, and that 
they, asbestos was perhaps part of the toxicity of a cigarette. Um, but you didn't, you didn't think about that. You thought, oh yeah, smokers, smokers get cancer. We know this, that's not good. Asbestos miners, asbestos saves people. It doesn't kill people. And so there was still this belief in the safety of asbestos. Um, the, the thing that was also obscured by this was, you know, lung cancer is not lung cancer, full stop. Lung cancer caused by asbestos, any cancer caused by asbestos has pieces of asbestos in the tumor. That it's very easy to see that this is an asbestos caused cancer. Lung cancer caused by cigarettes doesn't necessarily have the asbestos in the tumor. Um, but, you know, how about we don't ask about that and we won't think about that. Okay, sounds good. Um, so, yes. <laughs> By the time um, this report on the smoking emerged, co the company knew that of the 78 lungs that it had taken from asbestos miners over the past 20 years, um, secretly smuggling them across the borders, they had, oh, there were 78 unreported cases of asbestos caused cancer in these, in these lungs. Um, those families were never told that, first of all, their, lung, their loved ones' lungs had been taken from their bodies, um, nor were they told that their loved ones also died of asbestos-related cancer. And so that is um, the way the tobacco industry saved the asbestos industry, um, because by and large, these workers smoked. So that's why they died. Um, and so we were, we, we were quite okay with that as a society. Um, without informing McGill of this evidence, it once again looked to the university for some help. Because, you know, reports, you know, not every doctor believed that it was just the tobacco industry that was causing minors to get sick. And maybe we needed an, another Canadian report on the workers in asbestos to show that this is actually the case. Um, this brings in the Quebec Asbestos Mining Association, otherwise known as CAMA. Uh, which was a pro-asbestos lobby group. Um, it was more than half of its funds came from Johns Manville and it was quite directed by the company. The company had officials on the board of CAMA. And, um, you know, it is the organization that got in touch with McGill and got in touch with Dr. McDonald to see about doing a test on the people of asbestos. And this is Dr. McDonald here in 2009 and winning an award um, for his work on researching the population's health. Um, this is a quote from the ceremony that Dr. McDonald has made unique contributions to research and teaching which have shaped the field of occupational health in Quebec, Canada and beyond. And he continues to address issues which touch the lives of working people. And I would agree that he um, has made unique contributions, um, but we can go over those in, a, in perhaps a very different way than this organization would like us to. Um, so the goal of McDonald's study, according to CAMA, the, the group that funded it, was to preserve the industry on which business depends and avoid any undesirable publicity or any precipitate action by the U.S. or Canadian federal government, which might be detrimental to the industry. JM was especially worried about the Canadian government's impact on the industry in the late 1960s, as Pierre Trudeau, Jean Marchand, and Gerard Pelletier were making their way to Ottawa, and these three men were present in asbestos in 1949 during the strike. Marshall was the secretary of the union. Peltier wrote in Le Devoir extensively on the health effects of asbestos, and Trudeau walked around feeling cool. Um, but <laughs> these people knew that asbestos caused horrible, horrible diseases. The company was worried what would happen when they got to Ottawa. Do we know what happened when they got to Ottawa? Nothing. They had forgotten, or it no longer interested them there were other things to, to think about. Um, so, you know, they didn't really have anything to worry about with, with these three men here. Um, so, McDonald was set to confront the industry's healthy nemesis, um, Dr. Irving J. Selikoff, based at Mount Sinai in New York, who was a very vocal critic of asbestos, including the Canadian asbestos industry. Um, and he found, oh, and there was a report at the time as well that found that a majority of men who died in Montreal, as well as 34% of women, had a surprising amount of asbestos fibers in their lungs. Oh, goodness gracious, it's gone beyond the working class. 
this is something to panic about. We need some help to say this is actually not that big of a deal. Um, <laughs> you know, asbestos was still used in the 1960s, 1970s, and everything it could be. Montreal specifically has very high concentrations of asbestos in the air because of brake linings, construction, the pavement, everything in, everything in Quebec is paved with asbestos, um, which is not why the roads are so full of potholes. But um, yes, so McDonald was sent to the rescue. Um, by all accounts, McDonald is a respected researcher, um, definitely, but I would also like to suggest that even respected researchers see what they want to see sometimes or see what they're encouraged to see sometimes. Um, they are certainly human. McDonald found a lot of incidences of asbestos-related disease in Jeffrey Mine workers. Um, there was a lot of pleural thickening of the lungs that comes with asbestosis, and there was a lot of mesothelioma. Um, however, McDonald concluded that while asbestos dust can be dangerous, sure, these diseases specifically found, by the way, in the bodies of workers at the largest asbestos mine in the world, were actually unrelated to the mineral. What were they related to? Oh, cigarettes, of course. Um, again, the tobacco industry became the scapegoat. Further to this, McDonald examined 428 of the women employed at the Jeffrey Mines Mill, traditionally the dustiest place to work in asbestos. Um, but he said, you know, these women only work on average 10 years at a time. It takes about 30 for disease to develop. So they're not that interesting, not a problem. This really goes against international medical reports emerging at the time, especially from Britain, um, that were showing that while asbestos affects uh, the major organs in men, that that's why you get lung cancer, mesothelioma on the lining of your heart. Um, in women, it affects their reproductive organs. You get breast cancer and ovarian cancer if you're a woman of exposed to high doses of asbestos. Um, whereas men get lung cancer, heart cancer. <clears throat> this is quite a revolutionary thing to say. In the 1960s, a woman's body um, takes in environmental toxins in different ways than a man's. The Canadian medical community still doesn't accept this idea. Um, but again, when you find asbestos fibers in a tumor uh, found in the breast or an ovary, that is really beginning to suggest certain things. Um, and despite the, this rejection of, oh no, women's bodies aren't different than men's, McDonald didn't bother to look. And that, again, is kind of seeing what you want to see, doing what's expected of you. Um, so this was, this was an issue, especially considering in 1944, uh, Johns Manville had to send a special envoy of women employees to the town of asbestos because they were complaining about the high rates of absenteeism among female employees. These women were sick. They were getting sick. They called in sick a lot. But they were women. They didn't really have much of a dedication to work anyway. This was the conclusion of the company. Um, and that's, that was the result of their report, saying women are just naturally prone to calling in sick. Um, you know, this was a problem. But it wasn't a problem that interested McDonald. And so he, uh, well, he did address the issue of domestic exposure, exposure to asbestos, if it's in your walls, if it's on your clothing. He said that it wasn't really a great concern because Canadian asbestos, again, isn't all that bad. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, this, this report was excellent for the industry. It bought... Um, the asbestos industry time. Johns Manville did not have to heavily edit it like it had in the past. Um, Cam Minutes acknowledged that Johns Manville was practically the only respected asbestos company left in the world, um, and this was partly due to its control over the bodies in the town of asbestos, that it still had this pure group in which to look at and to prove that asbestos was safe. Um, CAMA officials also stated that the question of asbestos and health was not a bigger problem in Canada as in the United States. Besides, the audience is mostly confined to Quebec and more in the English than in the French press. It seems that the French media have never tackled too strongly the asbestos and health problem. It should be pointed out, however, that the release of, McDon of the McDonald report received excellent press coverage. And so it did exactly what CAMA wanted it to do. 
And this idea of the, the pro-asbestos lobby groups that asbestos is not really a big deal in Quebec, we can ask ourselves if that, if that is true still today. Um, it's perhaps um, partly due to the legacy of you know, medical researchers' alliance with the company. Um, McDonald's study, however, could only go so far. It was released in 1970. It was released in the early 1970s. In 1974, CBC Radio interviewed him about his study, um, and they repeatedly asked him if it was funded by the asbestos industry. Uh, McDonald continued to insist it was McGill that provided the funding for the study, but then eventually admitted that Kama had provided the university with a significant amount of research money. And so just because his checks weren't signed by Kama did not mean that McGill's checks weren't signed by Kama. Um, this was another reason why I reacted strangely to the documentary on the CBC last month. Um, the CBC had already exposed the ties between McGill and the asbestos industry. And it was a huge shock in the 1970s. And then we forgot about it. We did it again now. It's a huge shock. When are we going to forget about it? Right. You know, sort of thing. And this, again, speaks to Cam's point that it's not a big deal here. Why? Who knows? It's, it's somewhat not a big deal. Perhaps it will eventually, in 30 years, when we, we have another report on the CBC about McGill and asbestos. But um, we'll see about that. <laughs> anyway, um, this revelation that McDonald's report was somewhat funded by the asbestos industry immediately discredited him. The New York Times ran a big article about how his falsified report, and he threatened to sue them for libel. Um, he very much was convinced in the validity of his report. He did not alter his evidence. He reported what he saw, and that's important too. He's not some evil villain in the corner being like, I know what we'll do. Let's doctor things. No, he, he believed in what he saw. What he saw was wrong, however. Um, a French Canadian report coming of, uh, that had studied the asbestos situation uh, reported that while mesothelioma rates were one in 10,000 in Quebec as a whole, which is fairly normal, there were one in 10 in the asbestos communities of the province which could not be attributed to just smoking, um, that there was something wrong here. And so there was a problem. Um, <laughs> McDonald's international credibility was in a shambles, um, although obviously McGill and the Quebec Center for Health Researchers continue to believe that his work is uh, beyond question. Uh, it was becoming increasingly difficult for Johns Manville to defend the industry it was being assaulted by lawsuits in the United States where they could not get asbestos-related disease off the list of compensatable diseases. Um, and, you know, South African asbestos couldn't help them now. The tobacco industry couldn't help them now. It was becoming increasingly clear that Canadian asbestos was, was pretty awful. Um, so, Johns Manville, what did they do? They go bankrupt. Okay, now they reinvent themselves. They're no longer an asbestos-producing company. They're friendly. Okay, great. So Johns Manville somehow was able to do this. It's still sort of a sketch bag company, I think, in a lot of people's minds, but it's still a very successful company now, despite its brief bankruptcy. Um, McGill, on the other hand, remains, and the legacy of McGill and asbestos also remains. Um, so Kama has since been transformed into the Chrysotel Institute, which uh, receives a shameful amount of provincial and federal funding to promote the Canadian asbestos industry everywhere it can. Uh, its headquarters are on McGill College, just below Sherbrooke, so technically not on McGill campus, but it is a very convenient location um, if any sort of negotiation was going to happen. Um, and further to this legacy, further to this is the legacy of misinformation still present at McGill. Um, staff members are told that the asbestos plaster used to coat the walls in several of these buildings um, is a naturally occurring phenomenon um, due to asbestos in the soil. But as far as my research goes, um, asbestos in the soil is soil that's been contaminated with asbestos uh, that's been dumped. Um, asbestos is found in rocks, not dirt. And it actually, um, in actuality, asbestos plaster was something that was invented in 1896 by the manager of the Jeffrey Mine. Um, 
in order to sell the short strands of asbestos fiber that the Jeffrey mm -hmm. mine contained in order to compete partly with South African asbestos. Um, so that, that is just, I wonder about the misinformation being distributed about this. Um, also, we have to remember that McGill is still a working medical department. It's very respected, and I would never question that. Um, although I do wonder what students at McGill are taught about asbestos-related disease. Um, I was talking to a resident at the Royal Vic a few weeks ago, and I mentioned that Montreal is one of the Quebec cities on the WHO watch list for contaminated drinking water because the majority of the pipes in the city are made of asbestos cement which again is an invention made by the manager of the Jeffrey Mine in the 1890s. He was quite the inventor. Um, <laughs> but it makes cement stronger. And so you don't have to replace these pipes as often as other kind of pipes. That's why they're still around. Um, this brings you know, asbestos into our drinking water. The resident replied, well, surely that doesn't matter. Asbestos affects the lungs when in fact asbestos affects all major organs. It's like a sliver, a toxic sliver. And so if you drink asbestos, it goes through your body and if it gets stuck somewhere, I'm not saying you're going to die, we're not all going to die of asbestos-related disease, um, but there is certainly that chance. This is not a harmless factor in Montreal life, that this is something to consider. Um, especially as asbestos-related cancers have been found in kidneys, livers, um, bladders, colons, everywhere. Um, it, it loves the body. <laughs> um, and so that is an issue as well. That just, okay, emergency room resident, maybe you're not an expert, that's okay, but what exactly are you being taught? It would be interesting to know. Um, the email that the Dean of Medicine sent to the McGill community in response to the CDC's documentary saying that the dangers of chrysotile asbestos, um, there was still a topic of debate at the WHO. Um, the WHO is a, is a political body. It is not an unbiased computer that just says, this is right, this is wrong. Um, and Canada has certainly had quite the role um, in lobbying WHO members to say that as Canadian asbestos is all right. Um, and even then, that's not what the WHO says. Um, it has stated again and again that there is no way to tell how dangerous Canadian asbestos is. So it won't say that it's safe. It won't say at what point it becomes dangerous. It doesn't want to be involved in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, way to go, WHO. Um, faculty members interviewed by the CBC about McGill's ties to the industry could also have handled things a bit better. Um, and instead of saying that it was a myth um, that asbestos and McGill were somehow linked, um, and that those who say it's true are not honorable people, um, <laughs> They could maybe have said, actually, I didn't know about that. I can guarantee that we're not doing it now. Um, there, there's an attitude, perhaps, in certain um, departments at McGill that is defensive, and perhaps rightly so, um, because just because this has happened in the past does not mean that it's happening now. But um, it's also not productive. And that, of course, brings us to the issue of McGill's new super hospital. Um, which I'm not sure if you're aware, but is using asbestos cement in the pipes for its wastewater. Um, of course, this will save millions of dollars because asbestos is certainly cheap these days. Um, but whatever inspired hospital members to make this decision, <laughs> so, um, they forgot about the philosophy of a hospital. This is a state-of-the-art, brand new hospital should perhaps be a temple of health without a dirty little secret down below. Um, and so the fact that this is part of, of this new building that billions of dollars are being spent on already um, is quite shocking and it perhaps continues the legacy and it prevents a full understanding of the effects of asbestos pipes going into the wastewater. What, how is this affecting the, the ecology of the Montreal area? Um, there doesn't seem to be much of a consideration for this. Um, so <laughs> I think that McGill's ties to asbestos are, are longstanding. They're not, you know, intentionally evil, I would also say. Um, and perhaps in another 30 to 40 years, 
Um, the CBC will do another documentary and we'll all be shocked again. Um, and it just, it, it brings up continuously in my head at what point is Quebec society, is Canadian society going to start to care? And um, as long as they don't, then these things will continue to happen. And that is why in your grade eight history class, your teacher told you history matters. Um, <laughs> and so that is, is my ramble on asbestos and McGill. I'm sure um, there, there may be questions. So there may also be a comment, <laughs> a response. So please come on up. <laughs>